Welcome to the Damcasters. I'm your host, Matt Bone. In the early hours of the 10th of March, 1945, 279 B-29 superfortresses of the 21st Bomber Command firebombed the Japanese Imperial City of Tokyo. The firebombing marked a watershed in the US Army Air Force's strategic thinking and would see napalm used in vast quantities on the population centers of Japan. Yet the journey to this moment, on the eve of the atomic age, was one that those in command had very different viewpoints on. And the man at the top had a very specific goal beyond winning the war. Joining us today is author and historian James M. Scott, whose new book, Black Snow, Curtis LeMay, The Firebombing of Tokyo and the Road to the Atomic Bomb, looks in detail at the journey of Hansel Haywood, Curtis LeMay and their boss, Hap Arnold, to ending the war as soon as possible. A quick note on this before we get going, we're still working a few gremlins in the system out, so the audio quality on my side isn't what I would have hoped it to be. But you're here for James, and he sounds great. So to properly discuss this subject, there's only one place to start, and that is the man at the top of the US Army Air Force, Henry H. Hap Arnold. Yeah, Hap Arnold's actually one of the really one of the more interesting figures in the military leadership and that he is, I mean, in addition to running the army air forces, I mean, sort of the top, the top dog there, he's also an aviation pioneer. And it's important to remember, I mean, we, we kind of take aviation for granted these days because it's so common, but here Hap Arnold is running the largest global strike force in the world at that time. But he also learned how to fly from Orville and Wilbur Wright. I mean, which is incredible to think, and it just shows you how, how fast aviation developed. I mean, you go from these sort of wood and fabric biplanes to these muscular four-engine B-17s, B-29s, you know, able to just span oceans and, and, and continents in, the, in, in literally just a few decades. I mean, and, and Arnold, of course, sort of had grown up alongside of the development of aviation. The reason that early aviators wore goggles, you know, that trademark image of the early aviator is because Arnold got hit in the eye with a bug while landing one time. I mean, and so, I mean, it's just, so, you know, he is, he's sort of at the top of the American hierarchy of military aviation. And he, you know, had really seen and done it all. I mean, he's the first aviator to ever have fly, you know, ever fly over a mile high. I mean, he's the first aviator um, to buzz the Capitol. I mean, he one time as a, as a young pilot actually had to, did this stunt where he had to race carrier pigeons up and down the West Coast. I mean, he's just, you know, and, and of course, all of this builds up to him eventually running, you know, America's uh, Army Air Forces. And of course, as aviation develops, one of Arnold's top goals is he says, look, you know, this is no longer a service that can be wedded to the infantry and the cavalry. I mean, it has it needs to break away from the army and it needs to be an independent air service. And that's become really a huge goal of his over the over the two decades leading up to World War II is how can he convince, you know, the the senior American military leaders that the air service has grown up enough that it can be its own um, service. And, you know, and so that becomes sort of his overriding goal. And that plays a part in sort of the decision making and the war fighting, particularly as you see it in the Pacific, where he is very adamant that the air service must own its share of an equal share of victory alongside the army and the Navy so that it can demonstrate that it can stand on its own. And that's that vital element as well, because the commanders of the, the Navy and the army don't think they need that much help from anybody to it. It's being big personalities themselves. Exactly. And it just shows you too, I mean, a- aviation's really, I mean, it's particularly in the wake of World War I, where you had seen armies bogged down in trenches, you know, and, the, and these were just awful experiences for the infantry, you know, where, you know, men were living in trenches filled with, you know, mud and rats. And it was just this awful experience. And aviation kind of offered an opportunity to sort of bypass that, to jump over it, to turn an entire enemy nation into a battlefield. But of course, you know, with any kind of change, it's pretty arthritic. It, it, it's slow to develop. And of course, Arnold has to convince, you know, these old school battleship, you know, admirals and these old school infantry generals that, hey, this newfangled technology, you know, is actually going to be able to radically transform warfare. 
And, and of course, that's a slow process, you know, and that's that's one of the big frustrations that Arnold is battling throughout the 1920s, 1930s, even all the way up into the 1940s, is he's got to sort of change the opinions of these of these other leaders to do so. And of course, you know, and, and, and it doesn't and it's a struggle. I mean, even when even when World War Two breaks out and, you know, B-17s go into combat against Germany, you know, things don't pan out quite like Arnold and others had hoped they would. And so that, that, that struggle continues throughout the war. And that's the idea that the bomber alone is going through. And of course, in the US, you have Billy Mitchell, who's arguably the most famous proponent of the, the, the bomber doctrine, the attacks against the old German warships as well to prove just how effective bombers could be. That sort of permeates through to a lot of the people we're going to be talking about today. But just how fixed was that in planning and strategic thinking? in the 20s yeah, and 30s. It, it, it is. It's a big part of it. And, it, and you have to remember, it really goes back to Maxwell Air Force Base uh, down in Montgomery, Alabama today, which of course was the the home of sort of the uh, all the Air Force thinkers. That's where they went and did all their schooling there. And of course, it was during that time between the two wars that these, this idea kind of came about that you could use high altitude precision bombing and that you could pinpoint targets like steel mills, factories, uh, you know, bridges, and things like that, and really help collapse an enemy's economy. And, and the view was that an enemy's economy is a lot like a house of cards. And if you pull out a certain card or two at the bottom, the whole thing will collapse. And of course, that became the dominant thinking of these. Uh, they were they called themselves sort of the bomber mafia, if you will. And that kind of became the dominant thinking during that time and down at Maxwell. And, um, and the B-17... In the development of the Norden bomb site, you know, which was sold as this wonderful, highly accurate bomb site, would allow this to kind of happen and, and, and allow this to sort of be the way. And of course, war is where the rubber meets the road. And so when the war breaks out and these bombers and their B-17s, which they thought were sort of totally defensible, go up against the German fighters and whatnot, they get shredded. And, you know, the German Luftwaffe are like aerial Rottweilers and they just attack. And so a lot of these ideas that everybody had thought would make this this quick and painless path to victory are shown to be not the case. And this, and the air war just goes, you know, month after month and then into year after year. And also the German economy proved far more resourceful than people had thought, you know, they had the ability to disperse factories, you know, the, uh, the ability to take raw materials from occupied countries. And so, you know, it's, it's, it's a perfect example of what looks great on paper doesn't actually quite work out like you'd hoped in real life. Because when we're talking about precision here, you know, our yeah, me growing up, eighties and nineties, it's those Gulf War One videos that Stormy Norman used to show on the news every night of a bomb hitting a bridge, a missile going in through a window. That's kind of where our thinking is. That's kind of what they were aiming for then, wasn't it? It was building level sort of attack. But what was the sort of reality that they were finding in those early eighteen months of, of the eighth and combat? Yeah, you're exactly right. I mean, they were really thinking it would be this level of precision that that it certainly didn't work out to be. And of course, you know, the, the Germans had a big part in that you know, because, you know, <laughs> anti-aircraft fire and, and, and German fighters were uh, for these these American pilots flying in over, you know, over occupied Europe and over Germany. You know, this is their first time for many of them in any kind of combat scenario. And, and it was rattling. It was it was terrifying. You know, and you're flying in these B-17s with heated flight suits at, you know, 30,000 feet. You know, the temperatures outside are 40, de 40 degrees below zero. I mean, and so getting those bombs on target turned out to be a whole lot harder. And as Curtis LeMay once said, he's, once you cross that into the enemy's airspace, you've punched your ticket. You know, you've paid your price of admission. So if you don't hit the, that target, all of this is for nothing you're going to have to come back and you're going to have to do it again and again. You're going to have to take those same risks, go up against that same, the same fighters, that same anti-aircraft fire. And so as a result of that, it proved just to be so much harder than anyone had thought during those interwar years. And that's sort of pragmatism of LeMay coming through because he knows there's only so many ways you can attack something. There's multiple ways it can be defended. Yeah. And that's what makes Curtis LeMay, you know, who's sort of the centerpiece of this book in a lot of ways, such an interesting figure. And, 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 and LeMay, of course, you know, is a, uh, he's, he is, grows up dirt poor in, in Ohio. You know, his mother has the highest education in the household. She'd only made it through the eighth grade. His father's sort of this, uh, 
this derelict who kind of suffers between jobs, you know, and the family has, of course, has to bounce around from Ohio to Montana, California, and back. And so LeMay learns at a, at a very early age that he can really only depend on himself. And so he has to, you know, work jobs through high school just to have any kind of spending money. He He's working all the time, either between school or, or jobs so that he has no real friends. He, he doesn't play sports. He has no social life. Same thing happens in college. He works all night in a steel mill to put himself through college, uh, literally having to sleep through his first class just to be able to catch enough shut eye in order to be able to function that day. But all of this teaches him that, you know, he's got to depend upon himself. And he also happens to have a very engineering oriented background. And so he's a problem solver. So he's tireless, hardworking, and he's a problem solver. And so he then comes into Europe with the idea of, all right, if we're not getting bombs on target, why not? And what can we do to fix that? And so he comes up with new formations that the pilots can fly that maximize the defense of the B-17s. He uses his old days as an artilleryman to, re- to sort of analyze German artillery and determine that, hey, it's not nearly as accurate as we thought. We can fly longer, straighter bombing runs, get more bombs on target. You know, and, and as a result of this, he and his, his groups get much higher accuracy counts and, and bombs. And, and he's sort of seen as this rising star in the American Air Force at that time. And with good reason, because he's highly successful. He's one of those characters that his later career and the SAC LeMay, the Strategic Air Command LeMay, sort of completely blinds everyone to the analytical man that it was, the very pragmatic way, but also the care for his crews as well. He needed them to be able to do what they needed to do so that they could survive. Yeah, and that's kind of one of the tragedies of LeMay is that he he really is this amazing combat commander during World War II. And his latter career, unfortunately, overshadows all that. And, and if you look, and you know, when I was doing my research, I went through his entire personnel file. It's over 4,000 pages. And you look at the efficiency reports that his senior officers were writing about him. And, and these were legendary senior officers, men like Jimmy Doolittle, of course, you know, he's one of the most famous airmen from this time period. And they're all writing. I mean, he's that LeMay is, is, is brilliant. He's one of the best commanders we have, uh, one of the best commanders produced by the war. And he really is. I mean, he uh, and, 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 and it's fascinating, too, when you look at LeMay, because he did all this at, at tremendous personal sacrifice. And that's what's often lost is that if you read the letters that he sent back home to his family, you know, he was in his 30s at this point. So he's a young man. He has a, a young daughter whom he never sees. In, in all of his personal letters, he's writing about how he never gets enough sleep. I mean, that's like this theme throughout, like every other letter is like, man, when this war's over, I'm going to sleep forever. You know? <laughs> and at one point he, he gets to come home uh, very briefly and he sees his family and they're, uh, they're staying in, in Ohio and it's this frigid winter night and his little daughter insists on him coming out on the porch and sitting in the porch swing with him. And they sit out there for an hour on this just blustery night. And he and his wife later can, tells him, he says, the, the whole reason Janie wanted you to sit out there is because she was getting teased that she didn't have a father because you've been gone so long fighting. And so that's the thing is that, you know, for LeMay to do what he did took this great personal sacrifice, but it was a personal sacrifice. Again, his whole life up to that point had been about sacrifice. I mean, at one point he writes in his memoir that like through high school, you know, he didn't date, he, he didn't go to games. He had no social life that, that maybe, you know, he, there were nights when he would lie awake in bed and think of all the things as a young man he was missing out on, but most nights he was just too tired. And so, I mean, that's the thing that I, I really came to respect about LeMay is that he was just this dogged worker and problem solver that, that America really needed at that point in the war. And he very nearly got us the B-7 Valkyrie. <laughs> <laughs> there, there's an the time. The, the other side of the coin in your book is the, the other general that's exactly that, the other side of the coin to, to LeMay, which is Hayward Hansel. And he's, he couldn't be more different, could he? It's fascinating that you have these two men rising to the top of the U.S. Army Air Force having completely different outlooks on doing the same thing and being really completely different personalities as well. 
Yeah, no, I mean, as a nonfiction writer, it's the kind of thing that, I mean, you just, you, you get so excited about because it, you rarely get this opportunity unless you're writing fiction to have such stark differences in your characters. And yet, you know, here you have, you know, Brigadier General Haywood Hansel, who had in Europe is actually LeMay's boss. And he is everything that LeMay is not. You know, he grew up the son of an army surgeon and this sort of, you know, aristocratic Southern lifestyle. You know, his family was, uh, you know, his family had served in every military uh, campaign in the U.S. all the way back to like the Revolutionary War. You know, he was this great intellect and thinker. Uh, he was, um, he relished academic arguments and strategy, but he was not a predator. He was a planner. And that's the huge difference between him and LeMay. And that's, that's where Hansel, and of course, Hansel believes wholeheartedly in the efficacy of di- high altitude daylight precision bombing. He's one of the architects of this idea and, and brings this to Europe. And of course, he's absolutely committed, wedded to this idea, uh, even as it struggles. And so, and then on the flip side of that, of course, is Curtis LeMay, who is about figuring out how can we make it work. And so you have these two guys who ultimately goes in a completely opposite direction from Hansel. But you really, the fascinating thing is you just have these two guys, you know, one of them is a planner and one of them is a predator. And that's the, uh, that's the difference between the two of them. And of course you really see that collision amongst these two men when it comes to the air war against Japan. And of course that's the, the subject of what, you know, Black Snow is all about. So we keep mentioning characters. We can't do this without the big silver character in, in the middle of the B-20 Super Fortress, which is the tool that both of these men are going to use to try to end the war in two very different ways. And it's amazing that it's an aircraft that has one of the worst development histories. And this is speaking as a Hawker Typhoon fan, right? This the B-29 <laughs> is terrible. And yet, Hap Arnold has literally bet the farm and most of Fort Knox's shiny stuff on this thing. It's a fascinating aircraft, but it's one that's lacking in time. It's, it's being crushed. Yeah. yeah, I'll tell you, you know, the B-29 and the story of its development just absolutely fascinated me. And because, you know, the B-17 is, is this iconic bomber because it's, of course, the dominant bomber that's used in the air war against um Germany. And so, but people forget that the B-17 actually was developed, you know, years before war actually began. And so America had time to work out the kinks and the bugs and whatnot. So that by the time air crews are headed into the heavens over, you know, France and Germany, that they have a a very reliable weapon. That's not the case at all with the B-29. I mean, the B-29 is, first off, it's, it's the super fortress. So like its name implies, it is far larger than the Flying Fortress, the B-17. So it's just bigger on all all levels. It has a tail that literally rises the height of a three-story building. Its wingspan is 141 feet. Its wingspan is longer than the Wright brothers' first flight. This four-engine bomber has the largest propellers that have ever been put on an airplane. I mean, everything about this thing is just supersized. Uh, And of course, you know, the U.S., makes this massive gamble on it. It costs $3 billion, making it the single most expensive weapon system of World War II. I mean, the, the atomic bomb, which employed 130,000 scientists, technicians, and laborers, only cost $2 billion. And the U.S. put this bad boy into production before they even knew if it would fly. And that's probably and- one of the greatest gambles of World War II is Hap Arnold saying, you know what? If we're going to bridge these distances to Japan, and that's, that's the thing that really drives this, is the massive distances in the Pacific. But if we're going to be able to take the air war home to the Japanese people, we're going to need a bigger bomber with bigger range that can bridge those great distances in the Pacific. And that is the genesis of the B-29. Of course, how all that plays out is, is, is an entirely different story. And, uh, and if you want, we can go down that road a little bit, too. That's equally as fascinating, I think, Matt. Let's. And we just need to say that's three billion in nineteen forties dollars. That's not NFL team money. This is like astronomical amounts of. Oh yeah, of, yeah. I mean, that's like dollars. that's like the equivalent today of 
of, um, I mean, almost $50 billion. I mean, so, you know, for a bomber that, that on one of its early test flights actually crashed into a Seattle meatpacking company and killed 30 people. Beyond that, I mean, just not only was this thing so big, but just to be able to build them in the quantity that we needed to be able to take this war to Japan required literally tens of thousands of workers. And uh, in America, actually, the, uh, the the U.S. government went so far, actually, the federal government did, is to build a brand new city in Kansas called Plainview, Kansas, just to house this army of workers in one of their main factories there. And I mean, and on top of building the houses, they had to build movie theaters, elementary schools, I mean, a bowling alley. I mean, it just gives you a sense of just how staggering the production was so that we could build enough of these planes to eventually put five, six, seven, eight hundred of them in the skies over Japan at any one time. But a plane like this that is sort of goes straight from the drawing board to combat, you're going to have a lot of problems with it. And that's exactly what happened. Okay, so these B-29s, these first B-29s literally roll out of the hangars uh, in, in early 1944, and they, you know, they head straight to the war in Asia. And as you can imagine, all these kinks come with them. And one of the biggest ones there were the fires and the engines. And in fact, if you look at some of the early the photographs of B-29s in combat, when they were starting the engines up, there's always guys underneath them with fire extinguishers. I mean, imagine imagine you know how comforting that must be if you're one of those airmen sitting in a bomber with 8,000 gallons of fuel in there. There's a guys out there with a handheld fire extinguisher, you know. And, uh, and of course, you know, the distances that these guys are flying, right? So, you know, if you take off from England and you go bomb Berlin, and you come back, you're looking at about a 1500 mile round trip mission. Okay. If you take off from the Mariana Islands where these were based, you know, Guam, Saipan, and Tinian, it's 1500 miles one way just to Tokyo. Okay. And if you run into engine problem taking off from England, you know, or if you get a, a bunch of flak or fighter damage, you can bail out and you can hope that somebody in one of the occupied countries is going to find you before the Germans do. And that, you know, there's none of that in the Pacific. I mean, you bail out. I mean, if you put down or you bail out, it's ocean. I mean, it's dark unforgiving water. And we eventually take Iwo Jima, spring of 1945, which gives an emergency landing spot there. But even then, I mean, if you're coming out of Tokyo with a whole bunch of combat damage and whatnot, it's a long, scary seven, eight hour flight home that you hope you can make it. So it's a, uh, you know, that's what I'm saying. The the, the B-29 adding is just a, is a whole other variable and this just this crazy equation of the air war that gets the Pacific. We tend to think of the, the strategic campaign in, in terms of Europe because that's kind of where all the movies are, aren't they? You know, Trump, that's right, Memphis Bell and, and things like that. The thing that I think your book does really, really well is just how long this mission profile was. The notes you have from the pilots of you know, lots of water and more water. Yeah. And if you do get put down, you just hope that there's one of the prowling submarines near enough to, to pick you up, which thankfully there was quite a few prowling submarines. It has run out of things to sink by that point. That's a, that's a different podcast. Um, <laughs> but I think that that's that's fantastic the way you convey that in the book. That you know, even for experienced crews, this was a whole new ball game. This was completely different to what they were expecting. Yeah, and that's the thing. You know, I mean, you can be the best pilot in, in the in the country, but if you've got a, a, a problematic engine on your bomber, there's just nothing you can do about it. And you know, and you've got a plane here that's made out of fifty five thousand parts any one of which could just go wrong. You know, I mean, that's, and that's the thing, you know, and it's, it, it's so technologically advanced, you know, you have all these extra ways in which you can have issues and problems and challenges. So that's a huge part of the, uh, of this whole thing. And that also is what leads in part to some of the great demoralization you begin to see early on in the air war against Japan of these air crews, because, you know, not only are they struggling to get their bombs on the target against Japan, they're they're having to deal with you know frightening problems with their planes. You know they've got an unreliable weapon early on. Uh, you know the Japanese are raiding them there in the Mariana Islands. From at that time, the Japanese controlled Iwo Jima, so they're flying attacks against against them there. So you've got all these challenges that are leading to uh, low morale amongst these airmen. We're just going to take a short break for a quick message from our friends. Hello, folks. I'm Zach White, chair of the Napoleonic and Revolutionary War Graves Charity. We're a new organization seeking to honor the veterans and war dead of the period 1775 to 1815. What many people don't realize is that those who served or died in conflicts before the 20th century 
are not covered by war graves commissions, meaning that many veterans' graves are lying in disrepair. But the problem is more serious than that, because plenty of veterans' bodies are being discovered, but nobody is burying them. Instead, these war heroes are lying in cardboard boxes in storage facilities or even being placed on display. At the NRWGC, we'd like to change that, restoring graves and, importantly, giving these veterans the basic dignity of a proper burial. We also run a host of events from evening talks, study afternoons, and get-togethers for our members. So if you feel that the war dead deserve these basic dignities, take a look at our website, www.nrwgc.com. You'll find all the details you need on what we're trying to do, the progress we're making, how you can donate, and the perks of being a member. Most importantly, I'd ask you to talk about our organisation and our vision with your friends. We need to start a conversation on what should be done about these remains and what is and isn't okay. Without that, these people will continue to lie forgotten and their sacrifice ignored. With your help, we can change that. So please do visit www.nrwgc.com to find out more. Thank you. And we're back with James Scott talking about his new book, Black Snow. The thing I never knew as well until I read your book, completely black, there was still Japanese on the Marianas that hadn't been captured and flushed out yet. So these guys were still attacking the airfields as they're being built, as the bombers were there. So you were in year 10 and you could be attacked by guys who were just waiting for an opportunity as well. That with enough stress, you don't really want to think that there's going to be someone literally coming in to slit your throat at night. Oh yeah. And, and you know, not only that, you're, you've got that, but you're also living in these really austere rudimentary conditions. You know, I mean, the air crews were, uh, you know, had, had, had great lodging in, in, in England, you know, they had, it was just far superior on so many different levels. You know, here they are, they get out to the Pacific and they're literally sleeping in tents. You know, they're eating flight rations, you know, it's hot. You've got rogue Japanese troops still on the islands. You've got uh, nighttime raids by Japanese bombers and fighters from Iwo Jima. You know, on top of that, you're flying these 15, 16 hour missions. So, I mean, you're, you're the little bit of downtime you get is, is actually not all that restful. And so, and then you add to that, which of course is the early part of that war is when Han- Haywood Hansel was flying as the commander, you add to that poor bombing results. And of course, you know, he's the, he's the initial architect of, of America's air war against Japan. He's married to the concept of high altitude daylight precision bombing. And he finds very quickly that Japan is a completely different war than Europe. I mean, the, the cloud cover makes it so that there's some, some months, there's as little as three days of clear weather for bombing uh, a month, which if you're trying to do day altitude precision bombing, you got to be able to see what you're aiming at. And on top of that, they discover these just hellacious jet streams in the heavens over Japan that blow at you know 200 miles per hour, that totally wreck bombing accuracy. So, I mean, he very quickly realizes that this is a, a much harder problem than anybody expected. And his strategy of high altitude daylight precision bombing simply is not working. Bombers are having to return over and over again to the same targets and they're unable to wipe them out. And and Hansel proves unable to adapt. And Arnold's patience as he's trying to, you know, demonstrate that his air service can win this war, that it needs to be an independent service that they can knock the Japanese out of the war before America has to put any boots on the ground in Japan. All of that, just those pressures, all that just collides. And it eventually leads in January of 1945 to have Arnold firing Haywood Hansel and replacing him at that point with Curtis LeMay. Which is a big thing because Hansel is Arnold's guy, isn't it? He's been ear- earmarked for this role for a long time, hasn't he? It's removing him is well, the final straw of the results that he hasn't been getting. Yeah. And it, it has a huge effect on him. I mean, he really writes that, I mean, his whole world felt like it had sort of collapsed upon him. I mean, this was one of the, you know, premier combat jobs uh, that America had for airmen, you know, I mean, prosecuting the air war against Japan and he's fired and he's fired within just a matter of a few weeks from when, I mean, the first mission takes off November 24th, 1944. 
and he's fired in the beginning of January of 45. So, I mean, literally what, five weeks later. I mean, so Hap Arnold has no patience at this point. You either produce or you're gone. In fact, I mean, Arnold is uh, one of his uh, aides once said he'd have fired his own mother if she couldn't have gotten results. So, you know, and, and Hansel was, again, he was the planner. He was the thinker. He was not the predator, the combat commander that LeMay was. And so uh, Arnold picks Curtis LeMay, who, of course, has demonstrated that he's a problem solver, that he can solve the problem of, of German artillery, that he can solve the problem of better formations. And so they bring LeMay in at that point to do what Hansel has been unable to do. And, and you have to remember, Hansel and LeMay know each other. I mean, they're friendly. Hansel had been his boss at one point in Europe. In fact, in LeMay's personnel file, there's actually a commendation letter that Hansel wrote about him, congratulating him for all of his successes in Europe and thanking him. And so when LeMay shows up in January of 1945 to relieve uh, Hansel, and the two of them come face to face, I mean, LeMay actually now outranks Hansel. You know, he's of higher rank and, and, and they come sort of face to face. And Hansel, again, he's always this Southern gentleman. He says, I don't blame you for what's going on. I get it. He says, but I do want to give you some advice. And he says, remember, we will not be remembered for whether we win the war. Because at that point, I think it was pretty obvious Japan was eventually going to be defeated. Hansel says, but we will be remembered for how we win the war. And he says, I want you to sort of keep that in mind. I want you to continue doing sort of the high altitude precision bombing and sort of show that this is a better way of with you know, less civilian casualties and whatnot. And, and LeMay agrees. And he says, yeah, I, I don't have any intention of changing right now because at that point that was sort of the Air Force strategy of high altitude precision bombing. And it's often sort of glossed over. A lot of people say, you know, well, as soon as LeMay took over, you know, he threw out all the tactics and changed it to firebombing. And that's not really true, actually. I mean, LeMay actually spends weeks working within the bounds of what Hansel was trying to do. You know, he brings his bombers down a little bit from 30,000 feet to 25,000 feet to see if maybe that altitude change gets them under the jet streams. He tinkers with takeoff times, trying to bring them in at different times of day and things like that. I mean, he, he does what he does best. He tries to solve this problem. And he comes to realize over the course of several weeks that this is a problem for which there is no solution. And all those pressures that were weighing on Hansel hurry up and bomb Japan to its knees. You got to help us, you know, win the war, show that we need an air service separate of the army. All those pressures are now on LeMay. And he comes to realize in March of 1945 that he's got to have a radical re-engineering of America's way of attacking Japan. It's the compressed timelines here that always blows my mind. We're talking months, something that's taken years of figuring out and messing around with in Europe. They're literally, it's a period of weeks that these guys have got A, to keep their job, but B, to prove what they're doing. And yeah, that, ladies and gentlemen, is part of the, <laughs> the game and when, when, you're, when, you're, when you're a general. But then to prove that this new tool, this new way of fighting a war, the, old, yeah, the ultimate in strategic bombing that has ever been created to that point will actually work. And it's all happening in the course of what, four months? It's, it's, it's mad. Exactly. I mean, you think the air war against Germany goes on for years. I mean, just year after year after year. And the air war against Japan lasts less than a year. I mean, it, goes, it, it really goes from November, uh, the end of November 1944, of course, until you know, middle of August 1945. You're looking at, what, nine months? I mean, Hansel's given a, all of about five weeks to prove his theory, whether it works or not. And then he's out. I mean, it just, it is, it's like the whole war in Europe compressed into just a matter of months. So it is. And, but part of that, I think too, is because, you know, look, the world's patience is running out at this point. I mean, this war has been going on, you know, in China, it's been going on far longer than it has been in the U.S. Of course, in, in Europe, it's been going on longer. Germany, you know, surrenders in, uh, in the spring of 45. The, the American patience is running out. It's, it's extremely expensive. You know, 96 cents of every federal dollar spent is going to either the war or the debt service on it. You know, people are ready for this thing to be done and they're, they're feeling that pressure. And, um, and so there's a, there's a, there's, there isn't time to experiment and tinker. It's let's hurry up and end this thing. We have to remember as well, you've got Iwo Jima and Okinawa months apart as well. So yeah. there's, 
there's this, these horrible, horrible battles with massive casualties. And then the main island is just over there. It, it, it's all, it's all feeding in. We've talked about one weapon system. We need to mention the weapon that arrives in the Marianas. Napalm, which again, probably more famous from another, another war in, in Asia. The thing I've always found fascinating about it is in Europe, it's used tactically. So 9th and the 12th use it and fighter bombers, uh, second tactical use it as well, but it is, it is not employed strategically as far as I'm aware. The RAF are using therm thermite um, incendiaries, which is a completely different kettle of fish. Yet there's the willingness to use it against populated areas in the Pacific. And you've also got the PR guys making sure that even when LeMay is making the move to area bombing, they're still saying they're making precision attacks because it doesn't play well. So they've changed tactics. They've got a yeah, fire in a can, basically. But they've still got to say, no, 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 we're, we're still doing this other thing. That all of these things playing in just kept constantly amazes me. Yeah, and I'll tell you, it's, it's important to back up a little bit too, because, you know, LeMay, like I was, we were just talking about, you know, there's always this talk, well, LeMay just immediately changes tactics and whatnot, and, which is not quite true. I mean, he does do the precision bombing from January through March. But at the same time, also, America had been preparing for this. I mean, it wasn't just like suddenly LeMay wakes up one day and he's like, you know, hey, we're just going to burn Japan down. And, you know, no, I mean, this had been years in the making. And as you noted, the incendiary is a great example of that. I mean, the development of the of the napalm incendiary, you know, goes all the way back to the outbreak of the war. I mean, that sucker first gets tested. You know, napalm is developed and tested on the soccer field at Harvard, you know, and, and all the way back in 42, you know. And as they start refining this weapon and this delivery system for it, you know, they're like the American, you know, war planners go so far as to actually build this mock Japanese village out in the deserts of Utah, you know, and, and which is which is a kind of an amazing sort of sub story in and of itself because of their meticulousness. I mean, they they literally mirrored everything about Japanese architecture down to the point they actually went all the way to Hawaii to take the Tommy match you know, that iconic Japanese floor covering out of homes and temples. And then when they realized they weren't going to have enough of it, they actually built a tatami mat factory to manufacture more of it. And so throughout the summer of 1943, they just burned this thing down over and over and over again. And as they're testing and making sure and seeing if it works. And at the, at the same time, they're sort of, you know, they develop this new incendiary war planners are just going over Japanese cities and they're looking at sort of how they're laid out, you know, their sort of their their density levels, their their the way they're constructed out of wood and paper. You know, they determined, for example, in Tokyo, I mean, that the the density of certain parts of Tokyo are 135,000 people per square mile, which is just insanely dense. That there's a lack of major roads and fire breaks. That the average the average street through Tokyo is 12 feet wide, so you know, not enough to serve as an adequate fire break. So they put together these these incredible dossiers on every single city. And say, all right, if you're gonna if you're gonna attack the city with incendiary, this is the zone you aim for because you're gonna get really more bang for your buck, so to speak, and, and its flammability there. In order to do this, one of the most fascinating things is a lot of people don't remember it today, but Tokyo and Yokohama pretty much burned down in 1923 after a huge earthquake caused a bunch of fires, and that really kind of gave the blueprint for American war planners. And so when when they were looking at sort of how could you start similar fires. They actually brought in insurance adjusters who had worked for Western insurance companies and had worked that the aftermath of that 1923 fire and consulted with them on sort of the things that they had learned after that huge fire. So, of course, all of this is to say that by the time LeMay makes that fateful decision in March of 1945 to switch from precision bombing to fire bombing, he's got a perfect weapon in the form of a B-29 and a new incendiary. And he's got reams of data on every major Japanese city on what to target. All he's got to do is just sort of open up that booklet and point and they can draw orders on how to do it. So, you know, all of that is just showing sort of that, uh, that this march toward firebombing uh, Japanese cities had long been in the works, even before Curtis LeMay first touched down on Guam. It's, it's target analysis. It's, if, if you're going to fly a mission against something, you need to know how to destroy it. And it's yeah. whether that's, Something as simple as a yeah a munitions dump or a sissy, you're going to do do the work on it. So it's it sounds terrible to say, but it's good planning work that that leads yeah. to leads to that thing. 
we're going to change tack slightly because I don't necessarily want to describe how you describe describe it. It's your book. How the, the firebombing on the, the night of the 9th and 10th of March, 1945. Needless to say, dear listener, I was literally moved to tears with it. It's heartbreaking, horrifying, and a beautiful piece of writing by James. The thing is, he switches perspective at this point, and you are on the ground in Tokyo. And I wanted to ask you, what was it like doing that research, finding those stories? Because I had never read anything like that before. I'd very much read, yeah, the the pilot's eye view of it. What was it like for you as you were digging into those stories of that terrible? Yeah, and, and that's an important part of the story uh, and, and one that's so often missing from the historiography of the air campaign against Japan is what was it like for those civilians on the ground? And, and you, know, you have to remember this one raid that LeMay flies on the night of March 9th, 1945, in the early morning hours of March 10th. I mean, it incinerates 16 square miles of Tokyo and kills over 100,000 men, women, and children. And so when I was working on this book, I was really adamant. I wanted to to learn what that was like on the ground. And so I, I spent time in Tokyo doing research and I was fortunately able to interview a number of survivors of that and meet with Japanese historians to be able to kind of learn and also look at significant amounts of Japanese documentation and reports on it, because I really wanted to reconstruct what it was like on the ground there during this hellstorm, and and, 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 and convey that for the reader, because it is, it's such a, uh, I mean, part of it is my own curiosity, you know, when you read about something like this. I mean, I think all of us have a, it's why, it's why people slow down on the interstate when they see car wrecks. You know, there's this gruesome, you know, curiosity that humans have. And, and, and here you have this just this calamitous event. And I, I was really interested in sort of getting into the granular level detail of it. And I was really fortunate in that so many survivors in Tokyo were willing to sit down with me. And, uh, and there's also a private museum opened uh, about 20 years ago in Tokyo, and uh, they've got a, a whole collection of survivor accounts, books, texts, things like that. They also have some amazing artifacts and displays, including, for instance, like coins that had melted together that just really give you a sense of just how hot it was. Because that's the, that's really one of the things that I think struck me in listening to, to these accounts is, is, you know, people think of fire and whatnot, but if you're trapped in a firestorm of this magnitude, one of the things that it's the noise of it that people talk about. It's like a freight train constantly going by you because what happens is a firestorm essentially creates its own weather system. As the air is the hot air is escaping skyward, it creates this vacuum and nature hates a vacuum. And so all the cold air and, and from the sides of the firestorm start rushing in and it creates this sometimes a hurricane force winds that are just strong enough to topple trees and utility poles to, to rip, infants from the arms of their mothers. And of course, added to all this is just this extreme heat. And then you have pockets of heat throughout it that can sometimes, I mean, being a hundred feet away, you could have a temperature variance of, of, of hundreds of degrees. And of course, you know, after this, you know, scientists were able to determine that there were part, places inside the Tokyo firestorm that literally reached almost 2,800 degrees Fahrenheit, because I mean, hot enough that concrete begins to break down. And that's, that's hot enough that sliding boards on playgrounds melt and warp, that rebar in buildings and steel beams and roofs begin to, to warp and melt. And so I, uh, you know, and so talking to these survivors, you know, I was really curious, like, what, how do you survive this? Like, and, and, and one of the things I came away with is that the only way people survive is it comes down to luck is that there's, there isn't, you know, Japan had been so ill-prepared. I mean, the government just did a, a criminal job in preparing its citizenry for the possibility of these fire raids, which is astonishing considering that all they had to do was look at what was going on in Germany to get an idea of what, you know, awaited Japan and its future. And yet they didn't do that. And so civilians, you know, they, hand, they dug these little tiny foxholes in front of their homes, which just offered no real protection. I mean, it just, and then people flocked to the handful of concrete schools and buildings like that. And in those properties, you know, of course, they were safe for a while, but then the glass and the windows begin to melt and the doors. And of course, then the sparks come in and then hallways and stairways begin to function like chimneys and they're just superheated air and, and toxic gases are going through. Um, and then of course, open areas likewise um, ended up you know, becoming seas of fire and as, as grasses burned and canals bubbled and boiled. And so really 
luck came down to if you either lived on the periphery of where the firestorm was and you had the ability to get out or it came down to luck. And it just, it's, uh, but I was really, really fortunate in working on this to have so many people willing to sit down and share with me their stories, which I then uh, relay in the book. It's not easy to read. And that is very much a, a compliment to how you've, you've managed to put that together. And I think that the testimonies that they, that they've shared with you are incredibly, incredibly harrowing and moving. And the, the thing that keeps sticking in my mind is the items that they took with them, like the cooking pots, the things that to a Western mind, you wouldn't grab, but to them, it was everything, just pots, pans, little, little, little items like that. And then having literally nowhere to run because everywhere's on fire. Exactly. And that's the thing people don't realize. I mean, Japan at that point was so, because the submarine blockade had so cut off imports of everything from food to raw materials that, that if you lost your rice pot, you couldn't get a new one. And so, I mean, these things became just, I mean, treasures. I mean, if you needed these things to be able to survive because you could not replace them. I mean, by the time of the, the firebombing attacks, I mean, there's, you know, the Japanese diet, the daily caloric intake is plummeting. The ability to get food is, uh, is becoming harder and harder. Residents are having to scavenge for supplies outside of urban areas in the countryside. I mean, they're reduced to eating weeds and things like that because Japan is just so cut off and isolated and people forget that it's a, a pretty much a materially bankrupt nation. You know, they don't grow enough food because so much of Japan is mountainous. You know, they, they depend on importation from, from China, Korea, the Philippines, all of which, you know, you can't, you can't import goods if the submarines are sinking all of your merchant ships. So all that then adds up to when the firestorms break, you know, you got to hang on to everything you got. Because that's all there is. You're not going to get more of that. And, uh, and the war, as we would see, would still go on for months and months after that. And of course, these residents are left having to sort of bed down in the ashes of their homes and in their cities for those remaining months of the war. The other thing that struck me is that this rate was not flown by that many aircraft. Yeah. In the, in the great scheme of things, it was, what, 380, 400 aircraft? Yeah, 325 took off. Yep. Uh, less than 300 actually made it to Tokyo, which is a small amount considering that by the end of the war, we would be putting 500 planes a night, uh, sometimes as many as 1,000 up over the uh, cities of Japan. And so, no, it wasn't. And uh, But for LeMay at that time, it was almost 90% of his entire arsenal. I mean, he hustled to get every plane flyable and to get him up there because he knew he needed to have this sort of critical mass of fire placed on these, these, these key districts in order to build the type of storm that, uh, that he ultimately unleashed. What has writing this book done, done for you? Cause it covers so many different aspects of conflict. It's, I've, yeah, I've, I've described it just plainly to friends as a pure war book because it's not just aviation. It's not about bombers. It's not about LeMay. It covers so many aspects of the experience of many, many different types of people. How did you find the experience writing it? Did it, did it move you and, and make you think different? No, you know, it, it totally did. And I'll tell you, I mean, for me, you know, I, I, I was able to interview pilots and bombardiers and navigators, you know, who flew these missions as well as the Japanese civilians on the ground, because you're right. It's not just a war story. It's not just a military story. It is a story at, at its heart about civilians who were trapped in this conflict and who are, are prisoners of their own government's, you know, unwillingness to surrender. I mean, Japan's economy was tanked by the summer of 1944, yet they hold on all the way till the end of 1945, essentially holding their, their population hostage to this conflict, all because, you know, the emperor is really adamant that he wants to, you know, not to have to surrender unconditionally and, and, and give up his, uh, his throne. And so the the citizenry pays the ultimate price. But I'll tell you, when I was working on it, you know, I, I thoroughly enjoyed getting to meet so many of the survivors and going over. And, and I walked a lot of these paths and, you know, and these bridges and places like that in downtown Tokyo, you know, I wanted to see. And I did the same with the 1923 earthquake stuff. You know, I went to where the uh, some of the worst of that fire was. And, and Japan's done a really great job of preserving uh, the records and the artifacts from both of those. And I, and I really wanted to see them because, you know, I'm, I'm a big, big believer in, you know, 
this experiential form of history, which is, you know, if you're going to write about a place, you go visit it. You know? yeah. um, but it was, I mean, I think the book was kind of like a big kaleidoscope of stories. You know, it was uh, civilians, commanders, it was the president and Hap Arnold and whatnot. And, you know, the biggest challenge was trying to condense it all into about a hundred thousand words. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I would have read volume two. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, thanks. <laughs> I'm working on that one now, actually. So, <laughs> Oh, there, there, there we go. James, this, this has been fascinating. I cannot wait for the book to get out in the wild. It's out in the States early September. So this is going out first of September. I think it's the 8th that your book is released. Is that right? Yeah, it comes out September 6th. My first event's on 6th. the 8th. And then I think it comes out in the UK in November, I believe. So, so we will re-up this in November. Yeah. And um, we'll, we'll definitely be I'm telling everybody about it because it is really a superb book. And I can't thank you enough for spending an hour to chat with me. Well, Matt, I can't thank you enough for reading it, for your compliments on it, and for having me on. I, I so appreciate it. Thank you. With Black Snow, James Scott has tackled a complex and controversial subject with skill and compassion that many who have gone before have lacked. It is a powerful book, and one that I feel very privileged to have been given the opportunity to read early and to chat with James about on this very first episode of The Damcasters. Black Snow is released on the 6th of September in the United States and on the 8th of November here in the UK. And if you are here in the UK, you can pre-order Black Snow through the Boney Abroad Podcast Bookshop, which is linked in the description below. Next week, we look at the politics of rearming the RAF in the years before the Second World War with Adrian Phillips. If you have enjoyed the podcast and would like to support us going forward, you can via Patreon. From just £3 a month plus VAT, you'll get all of our episodes on a dedicated feed, ad-free, and before they head out to the rest of the world. There's also a Discord server where you can chat to me about all things aviation-related, what's coming up for the podcast, and ask questions for upcoming guests as well. You'll also get a hand-scrolled thank you postcard from me, designed by aircraft.co.uk, to say, well, thanks. You can find our Patreon page in the link in the description below or at patreon.com forward slash the Damcasters, all one word. Thank you for your support. And until next time, do take care of yourselves. The Damcasters is hosted and produced by Matt Bone, and it is a Boney Abroad podcast production. To check out our other podcasts, head to boneyabroad.com.